Hello my fellow weirdlings, it's Margot, and today I'm bringing you the fascinating story of a decade of mysterious and seemingly spontaneous fires that took place in a small Italian village in the early 2000s. These mysterious events have attracted global attention from the media, scientists, UFO enthusiasts, paranormal investigators, conspiracy theorists, exorcists, and true crime fans. So if you're ready for a real life twisty turny mystery, keep watching. In 2004 to 2005, the village of Canetto di Caronia in northern Sicily was plagued by bizarre fires. The town was so small it had only one street running through it, called Via Mare. Canetto di Caronia is an outpost of Caronia proper, a small town with a population of about 3,400 people overlooking the Tyrrhenian Sea. One day, and for many years thereafter, along the street of Via Mare, electrical appliances and even an unplugged electrical cable just suddenly began to burst into flames. An extensive investigation ensued and the world became invested in the mystery, but this story got progressively more confounding with lots of twists and turns and unexplained phenomena over the course of the next decade. The fires have been blamed on everything from aliens to witches to ghosts to a government experiment gone awry to an unknown natural phenomenon and even satanic forces. But what's the real explanation? It all started on December 23, 2003, when then 43-year-old Via Mare resident Antonino Pezzino, an insurance salesman, realized in the middle of enjoying his dinner that his house was on fire. The source was a fuse box that had been engulfed in flames, which had quickly spread to the heavy curtains hanging nearby. This by itself didn't seem particularly unusual, as far as house fires go. But a few days later, Antonino's kitchen fan caught fire, followed by his television, and then other appliances one by one. Thirty-nine working-class people lived in a dozen houses situated closely together in a row, along normally peaceful Via Mare. Another hundred or so residents lived in the surrounding hillsides. Antonino Pezzino lived with his wife Maria and their son Giuseppe, who was 15 at the time the fires began. With the help of his father, Antonino had built his house in the 1980s and now assumed faulty wiring was to blame for the fires. At the end of January 2004, he replaced the wiring, but the fires continued. In the weeks that followed, Antonino's neighbors, including his parents, aunts, and cousins, who lived close together in four or five attached houses, all experienced similar mysterious fires. The tiny community was founded by Antonino's father and uncle when they built their own houses there in 1958, and a lot of the family had stayed close by ever since. Two electricians had tested Antonino's electrical system and hadn't been able to determine the source of the fires, so they decided to cut power to the affected houses until they could get to the root of the problem. But this didn't stop the fires from starting. Throughout the village, outlets burned hot, cords lit up like sparklers, and an electrical motor melted. Appliances were bursting into flames. One of the villagers had installed a new electrical system just six months earlier. That too caught on fire. As the fires spread, the residents began to suspect problems with the town's electrical grid. This was run by Enel, Italy's national electrical and gas provider. Antonino called Enel, but the company was unresponsive. So he finally called the mayor of Caronia, Pedro Spinato, who happened to be a good friend of his. For a while after Spinato was elected, in 1996, Antonino had even served in his cabinet. Mayor Spinato called the main branch of Enel in Palermo, the state government, and the Protezione Civile, or Civil Defense, Italy's equivalent of the National Guard. He was trying to find anyone who could help. In the first three months of 2004, Via Mare residents reported 92 fires. These families had limited resources and had worked hard to build these houses themselves. Now they were helplessly watching it all go up in flames. The tiny village was soon crowded with firefighters and the press. The air was constantly filled with smoke and the wailing of sirens. Antonino became the community spokesman. He told the press, it's like we are living in a microwave. This sort of became the town's weird little motto. Nothing along Via Mare seemed immune to spontaneous combustion. One resident recounted mattresses catching on fire as people slept on them. Antonino's aunt was devastated when her treasured keepsakes burned, including her wedding gifts, photos, silver, and linens made by her mother. 
One strange observation made by VMRA residents at this time was that whenever the local train would pass by the village, the fires would begin again. On February 9, 2004, two houses burned. One of the residents rushed into the local police station with the bottom of his pants and his shoes on fire. An article in a national newspaper reported that he'd said the devil was burning behind him, then hurled his shoes into the arms of a police officer. This man's daughter's room had completely burned charred black. He said he and his wife were afraid to leave their children in their house. His wife would later say they felt fear, anger, and desperation. When you lose everything, you become desperate. This is when Mayor Spinato, at a complete loss for what else to do, and aided by the civil defense, issued an evacuation order, removing all 39 residents of VMRA and relocating most of them to the town's only hotel called Zamaria, which was located on a hill directly above the village. There, the evacuated residents enjoyed a level of luxury they were unaccustomed to, courtesy of the city. Antonino's elderly Aunt Rosa told a magazine, I never stayed in a hotel before, and look at me now, here like a lady. Antonino, along with his wife and son, was evacuated to a nearby apartment. He hated being away from his home in the tiny village where he'd been born and raised, and the pet tortoises and dogs that he kept there. He later said the evacuation felt like a prison sentence. When I used to go to bed, it seemed to me like I was trespassing, he said. A police officer with young children, very beautiful twins, lived downstairs. If I moved, I would wake them up. I was not used to the rules of the town. On February 11, 2004, an investigation into the fires was announced by the local prosecutor. This didn't entirely sit well with the residents, to whom the inquiry felt like a slap in the face. An accusation that someone from their tight-knit community was responsible. However, they welcomed the opportunity to be exonerated. At this time, the affected homes were monitored around the clock by various government investigators, engineers, scientists, and technicians. On February 13th, a parallel investigation was launched by Massimo Polidoro of the nonprofit Committee for the Investigation of Claims of the Pseudosciences, or PSYCAP. Polidoro is a psychologist, writer, and television personality. He set about interviewing the baffled investigators for PSYCAP's magazine, The Skeptical Inquirer. One of these investigators was Enzo Bashi, the president of the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology. The affected area has a lot of earthquakes and volcanoes, which lend to a lot of seismic activity. As a result, volcanoes and earthquakes are a likely culprit for pretty much anything that goes awry, but Bashi said there was no indication that the fires were connected to volcanic or seismic activity. Technicians from Enel and the railway failed to find anything unusual. The telecom lines also looked fine. A member of the National Research Council of Italy hypothesized that the fires could have been caused by an abnormal increase in the electrical field. Others suspected a human cause. And then there was Padre Gabriel Amorth, a Catholic priest in Rome and honorary president of the International Association of Exorcists, who was certain that fires like these could happen when the devil enters in the life of a person who allows him entrance. He also added that the cause could be black or white magic, quote, the preferred gateway to Satan. He claimed to have seen this before, houses haunted by the devil and the devil manifesting through electricity. Father Amorth told the media, the priest of the parish ought today to go and bless all the houses that have witnessed paranormal phenomena because that is what they are. What is happening is what normally happens when the devil enters the lives of those who let him in. The local priest was rather disappointed by Amorth's take on the situation, saying, That is an absurd satanic hypothesis. The inhabitants of Canetto are hard-working people who struggle every day to bring home bread, not Satanism. The press ran with the outlandish Devil in Canetto story worldwide, which explains a lot of the off-the-wall articles I found while researching this. There's even a quote from this time from Antonino Pezzino stating, I'm Catholic. I believe in the devil. I don't know why the devil is here. If it happens again, I'm bringing in the exorcist. He went on to say, If we're going to do it, we have to do it right. In order to do it, you need a sacrifice for the immortal gods, like a black goat or a black sheep. You have to dig a hole into the ground, because this is serious. By this point, the situation at the Zamaria Hotel was chaotic and stressful, overrun with members of the press and evacuees. The hotel's lawyers sent a letter to Mayor Spinato asking for almost $100,000 in unpaid expenses incurred by the evacuees. 
On March 16, 2004, the fires resumed. The investigators got to witness the strange happenings firsthand. They experienced malfunctions in compasses and electronic car locks and cell phones ringing with no satellite signal. A car antenna became so hot that it cracked a windshield. Residents consulted engineer Francesco Valenti, who filed a 30-page document on March 31, 2004, titled, A Qualitative Report and Definitive Solution to Secure Canetto di Coronia. In this report, Valenti intriguingly quotes Dante, Galileo, Wittgenstein, and The Leopard, a novel about Sicily by Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampedusa. Valenti ultimately determined the fires were unforeseeable electromagnetic events caused by roaming electrical charges like lightning without a storm. Valenti advocated removing the railway lines, changing the angles of the power cables, and fixing all of the electrical systems above and below ground in the area. In the end, none of this advice was taken. The next month, in April 2004, the government formed an interdisciplinary research group which reportedly had widespread cooperation from Italy's armed forces, police, and utilities. The team reported anomalous electromagnetic activity, unexplained lights, and a helicopter that experienced inexplicable rotor damage when three of the aircraft's rotor blades seemed to be hit by something mid-air that ruptured the protective coating of each blade at the same point. But there was nothing in the sky near the helicopter that the investigators could detect. Scientists from the National Research Institute, with the support of NASA physicists, were also involved in this investigation. But then the fires suddenly stopped on their own. In June 2004, the Via Mare residents finally returned to their homes. However, things didn't fully return to normal in the sleepy seaside village. Because of the media's intense interest in this mystery, the public's interest was still rather overwhelming. Coronia City Hall, more specifically Mayor Spinato, was flooded with letters from people from around the world, offering their alternate explanations which ranged from the mundane to the paranormal. Popular theories involved poltergeists, demons, UFOs, various types of electromagnetic disturbances, and weird volcanic activity. The villagers enjoyed a quiet summer and hoped the danger of spontaneous combustion was behind them. Then one night in October 2004, Antonino dragged his son Giuseppe from the all too familiar flames. Again, multiple fires sprang up throughout the community. This time, there was added destruction when water pipes began developing holes and bursting, flooding multiple homes. The pipes under Antonino's kitchen sink were punctured. Young Giuseppe told the newspapers, First we were at risk of burning, now we are drowning, right at the moment when we have discovered calm and our homes no longer make us fearful. Another evacuation was ordered, this one lasting from October of 2004 through June of 2005. For the residents, this felt like an eternity. Anxious to get back home, the evacuees slept in the city offices in protest against the civil defense and regional government, who they felt had abandoned them. Mayor Spinato also slept there in solidarity. Antonino complained that the investigators were at fault for their situation because they'd stopped monitoring the town 24 hours a day. In April 2005, the Italian government formed a new research group. The new team included chemists, physicists, geomagnetists, and professors. They had the cooperation of the Air Force, Navy, and police, along with ENAL, the Communications Ministry, the Rail Network, and the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology. This team flew military planes over the affected area, taking pictures with telephoto lenses. They sailed a research vessel called the Galatia and analyzed the magnetic charge and chemical composition of the sea. Helicopters conducted radar and magnetic surveys on electromagnetic fields and monitored and mapped radioelectric signals and meteorological patterns. Instead of focusing only on Canetto, the team studied the whole region, including the sea and the airspace. The team found that there was nothing scientific that seemed out of the ordinary in Canetto in comparison with neighboring towns. They also found nothing unusual about the railway lines, electrical lines, and other technical installations. What they did find were increased levels of spontaneous electromagnetic activity that could not be attributed to natural phenomena. They concluded that the fires had an artificial cause. In May, the literary enthused engineer the townspeople had consulted before, Mr. Valenti, issued a second report on the possible health risks associated with the fires. This included electrocution and smoke inhalation, as well as the damage that electromagnetic radiation can cause in human bodies. 
Valenti blamed the government for not listening to him before and the city for allowing the evacuees to return to their homes. He also lashed out at the government's research team for failing to discover the cause despite abundant resources. Once again, Valenti's warnings and suggestions went unheeded. The following month, the residents again returned to their homes. During this time, Canetto had also elected a new mayor, Caligaro Berengeli. Spinato was out of office but still stayed close to the Via Mare residents. As the government's team continued their two-year investigation, no house fires occurred. However, in the mountains outside of town, they discovered two dense patches of grass that looked like they'd been consumed by a fire that had come from underground. In comparing the burn marks on the grass with the marks on the power cords from Canetto, it was found that the patterns were identical. They concluded that whatever had caused the fires in the homes had also burned the grass. Aerial photos showed that Canetto and the burned grass appeared to be situated in a straight line from the sea into town and up to the mountains. They hypothesized that the patches of grass had somehow conducted the same strange bursts of electromagnetic waves as Canetto. Also reported by investigators was the strange occurrence in January 2007 of a cell phone battery mysteriously recharging itself without being connected to a power outlet. That same month, the electrical system of a dry boat was found completely melted down while the rest of the vessel was intact. At this time, hundreds of blue valellas, sea creatures similar to jellyfish, washed ashore below the town. Factoring this in with the other strange phenomena seemed to suggest that whatever was happening to Canetto and the surrounding area was coming from somewhere outside. They determined that Canetto and its surroundings were being struck by intense bursts of electromagnetic waves of some sort at such a large scale that it couldn't be generated by one person. The team's coordinator, Francesco Montagna Venerando from the Sicilian Civil Defense, later said that the group had sometimes noticed objects moving around in the sky. On occasion, they would disappear with great speed, he said. We are not in condition to scientifically define the phenomenon. We did not touch them. We did not get inside them. This was problematic. His team also noted other unexplained phenomena, such as lights over the sea and lights moving in a formation from the sea to the land. Of course, the newspapers ran with stories of UFO sightings over Canetto di Coronia, just as they had with the satanic electricity headlines. After residents complained of pain in their extremities, Venerando recommended medical testing, but this never happened. He brought in a specialist who confirmed Mr. Valenti's assertion that electromagnetic waves could have negative effects on people, and that electromagnetic radiation of the type they thought was affecting the area could have grave consequences. But all of this remained unproven and wasn't acted upon. In the spring of 2007, the government shut down Venerando's study for what Venerando calls economic and bureaucratic reasons. That winter, Venerando's investigative team asked the government to renew funding and presented a seven-page summary of their findings, titled Coronia, It Only Seems Like an Enigma. This report introduced the group's working hypothesis that the fires were caused by electromagnetic pulses of great power coming from the direction of the sea near Coronia. They believed that, quote, experimental application of industrial technology, not excluding the possibility that it could be an electromagnetic weapon system, was behind the mysterious fires, but they didn't specify who was behind what they seemed to insinuate may have been a targeted attack. After this report was released, naturally journalists wanted to know when the research group would be releasing a complete report containing all of the data they collected during their study. The complete report never came. Venerando later said it was because they didn't want to generate alarm, that it was only for a matter of prudence and to avoid speculation and manipulation in the press. Former Mayor Spinato took the news of Canetto possibly being under a targeted attack, potentially by their own government, surprisingly well. Seemingly relieved to drop the talk of Satan and UFOs, he said, electromagnetic waves generated by a weapon pointed here from a satellite. That, I believe. What I don't understand, and nobody explained to me, is how does it happen? How indeed. But at some point, parts of Venerando's report did leak out to the public via various Italian newspapers. These leaks included details of a possible UFO landing close to the village of Canetto, seemingly attributing the aforementioned spots of burned grass to the landing of an unidentified spacecraft. Venerando responded that, quote, 
This is not the final report. We are still working on our conclusions, and this has been leaked. We are not saying that little green men from Mars started the fires, but that unnatural forces, capable of creating a large amount of electromagnetic energy, were responsible. He went on to say, this is just one possibility. We are also looking at another one, which involves the testing of top secret weapons by an unknown power, which are also capable of producing an enormous amount of energy. This led to renewed public chatter about extraterrestrials, a machine uprising, and even the possibility of a genetically modified insect being involved in the strange happenings in Canetto. On June 24, 2008, as spontaneously as the flames seemingly ignited, the prosecutor concluded that the fires were all cases of arson. Although no persons responsible, nor a possible motive, nor a method for the arson were named or even speculated upon. And this verdict was seemingly directly at odds with the extensive investigations done by a plethora of scientific experts. It seems that things were pretty uneventful on Via Mare for quite a while, perhaps too uneventful for some. The mysterious fires returned in July of 2014, 10 years after they originally began, and they were back with a vengeance. By September, there were up to 50 fires per night. In one 18-hour period, there were 48 fires, six of them at the home of Lorenzina de Payne, Antonino Pezzino's elderly mother. An embroidery basket tucked away in a closet burned and then a sofa bed. Loose wires caught fire, along with electrical outlets, then a television. The residents took turns sleeping outside in shifts, so someone would always be able to keep watch. Three residents suffered from mysterious burns, while others in the village complained of swelling and inflamed muscles. A member of the local civil defense told the Sicilian newspaper, this area is hit by violent electromagnetic fields, and we do not understand where they come from. It's like living in a microwave oven resurrecting the old village maxim. In the same article, Antonino Pezzino was quoted as saying, we knew that the phenomena had never completely stopped, but after 10 years, we were hoping for it. This is a hard blow for all of us. It means slipping back to the beginning of a drama that has already marked our lives. Once again, the residents of Via Mare were ordered to evacuate their homes. This time, the families packed up pretty much all of their belongings. As the residents were moving out, fires were still igniting. In one instance, when Antonino's relative, Salvatore Rossello, came back to town to pick up more of his belongings, the interior of his Fiat Bravo suddenly caught on fire. It was speculated that this could be the end of the inhabitation of Canetto di Caronia. But this time, things got really interesting as the investigation quickly took an unexpected turn. When the fires had started again, the civil defense announced that there would be a new group of investigators, which would work in tandem with the ministries of the interior, defense, health, and the environment. But another group of investigators, the Carabinieri, or Italian military police, also began looking into the fires. There was a new officer in charge who joined the local force just months earlier, Capitano Giuseppe Davini. Davini decided to launch a brand new thorough investigation. His first order of business was to install hidden cameras in Canetto. This proved to be almost impossible because the town wouldn't be evacuated for another month and people were out on the street keeping watch literally 24 hours a day at this point. Still, they somehow managed to install four cameras on Via Mare, facing the homes and street. By March of 2015, they'd been recording 24 hours a day for eight months. The footage the cameras captured didn't disappoint. On March 5, 2015, the Carabinieri had compiled enough evidence to arrest then 26-year-old Giuseppe Pazzino, son of Antonino, for arson, conspiracy to commit fraud, and sounding a false alarm in association with the mysterious fires. They managed to capture 40 incidents implicating Giuseppe in starting the most recent spate of fires. Antonino Pazzino was also implicated in some of the videos. Antonino was accused of sounding alarm about certain fires, having criminal designs, and working with his son. One of the incidents captured on camera was the aforementioned arson of the Fiat Bravo and Giuseppe's cousin's nearby Alfa Romeo. This video shows Giuseppe moving stealthily between the cars and a fire truck parked on the road. In one segment, he walks in circles looking to see if anyone is behind him, ducking out of frame the minute the car begins to burn. 
Initially, Captain Davini and his investigators thought Giuseppe was acting suspiciously, drawing attention to the fires that would break out shortly after he'd been seen close by, immediately alerting the press to come and see. They also noted that both Giuseppe and his father Antonino had been showing the fires to the media as if it was a tour of a haunted house attraction. They weren't incredibly surprised that these two men were involved. In mid-July, the Carabinieri had even tapped the Petzino's phone and recorded Antonino speaking about trying to get money for damages and drumming up more interest in the fires, with talk of paid television appearances and retaining a lawyer to receive compensation. When the person he's speaking to asks if he wants a new house, he replies, I don't want a house, I want money. It's also interesting to note that Antonino had been the president of the Victims Committee in charge of asking for help for the families affected by the fires. In another phone conversation between Antonino and his son, Antonino seems to be referencing methods of setting fires, possibly speaking in code, and addressing his suspicion that the police have been monitoring Giuseppe's internet searches. The odd conversation went as follows. Antonino, I think they've seen something, Pepe. Giuseppe. I don't know. Antonino. Or maybe something on the internet, something you searched for. You look for one of these incendiary powders or a laser. Giuseppe. The only thing I looked for on the internet was a winch, the one for the boat. Antonino. It's called a laser jet. In the same conversation, Antonino told Giuseppe, it's not about the insurance. This is very serious. They are going to throw you inside, meaning prison. The laser jet comment was widely reported in the press as proof of Giuseppe's guilt, yet this device, if it ever existed, was never found, and the police still don't know how the fires were set. So what do we know about young Giuseppe Petzino? When the fires first broke out in 2004, Giuseppe, known to his family as Pepe, was only 15 years old. Giuseppe is the Petzino's only child. At the time of his arrest, his frequent Facebook posts depicted him as a bit of a party boy, seemingly always out dancing, eating, or swimming with friends, described as a playboy. He worked with his father selling insurance, but is said to have not done a lot of actual work there. Still, he, like the rest of his family, was well-liked, and his arrest came as a shock to pretty much everybody who knew him. So what could have been his motive for starting the fires? According to the Carabinieri's press release, Giuseppe set the fires to raise the level of media attention and institutional attention. They think he felt that more fires would bring more fame and money for what was known as the phenomena of Coronia. News of Giuseppe Pezzino's arrest pretty much split people into four different schools of thought. The first group believes that Giuseppe set the fires in 2014, but not the original fires in 2004. People in this camp believe that there was an unexplained phenomenon in 2004 that originally started the fires. When the years passed and attention waned, the Petzinos devised a plan to resurrect their 15 minutes of fame in hopes of making money from it. Many people point out that the charges against Giuseppe only pertain to the most recent fires, asserting that the original fires remain unsolved. Another group believes Giuseppe is responsible for all of the fires, and there is no mystery. But many locals still believe that the strange incidents they saw with their own eyes are proof that there's no way all of the fires could have been set by human hands, and perhaps the Petzinos weren't responsible for any of them. And then there's the fourth group, which believes that Giuseppe may have set some of both sets of fires in 2004 and 2014, but not all of them for pretty much the same reason the first group believes, because more mysterious fires would mean more attention and possibly more money. Mayor Berengeli has said, I do not believe the resident to be guilty of some fires and hope the continuing investigation makes it clear. Lead investigator Venerando doesn't believe the 2014 and 2004 fires had the same cause, pointing out that the phenomena he'd observed during the course of his investigation had occurred over a wide radius, not only in a few homes. Massimo Polidori, the anti-pseudoscience investigator, felt that Giuseppe's arrest confirmed what he already believed to be true. While he was in Coronia in 2004, he observed that none of the fires took place when nobody from the village was around. But members of the community have observed that during some of the fires, neither of the Petzino men had been in the vicinity. 
One of Giuseppe's co-workers told the press that she was with him in the office when fires had appeared elsewhere. A member of the Petzino's extended family, whose house was completely destroyed in the mystery fires, said, I cannot believe that it was my relatives who set the fires. When I was burned, Antonino wasn't there. Giuseppe wasn't there. Giuseppe's grandmother, Lorenzina, told a reporter, I don't believe it. If it had been my grandson to do what they said he did, we would all be rich, because he would have extraordinary powers. She said her house caught fire on her 78th birthday, and insisted Pepe would have never caused that. For what it's worth, Antonino Petzino has admitted that Giuseppe set some of the fires, but couldn't understand how he could have been blamed for all of them. He's quoted as saying, I wish to understand how you could do them all at the same time, how you could manage and organize them. I do not understand how. I have to defend my son at all costs. I can admit that he has done something stupid. He did the most wrong thing in the world. People need to understand I wasn't there. For others, my son wasn't there. He says he's concerned about the fires that are still unexplained. In court, Giuseppe only admitted to setting three or four of the more recent fires. Since Giuseppe's arrest, the village of Canetto di Coronia is described as being practically a ghost town. Via Mare is largely abandoned. Fewer than 150 residents remain in Canetto. Many residents lost everything they had. It was too heartbreaking to go back and try to rebuild. It's also said that there was infighting amongst the villagers over what had actually happened there. One reporter described it as, they were fighting a war among themselves. It's reported that there are no longer children in the village, and only 10 people returned to Via Mare after the last evacuation. The Petzinos were among the few who stayed, living amongst the charred ruins of their past belongings. When asked how much money he'd received from the fires, Antonino Petzino responded that he was paid 60% of the cost to replace the destroyed items. According to the press, the events in Canetto cost the government over $600,000. This covered the scientific studies, hotel bills, and reimbursement for destroyed property. According to former Mayor Spinato, real estate values have dropped in the area since the fires because the cause has never been conclusively determined. Nobody wants to make a home in a place that's expected to burn down. Spinato is still good friends with the elder Petzinos, but says he doesn't know Giuseppe very well. In early 2022, Giuseppe Petzino, at age 33, was sentenced to six years in prison. He was convicted of 12 counts of arson, damage followed by fire, and fraud. He was also ordered to be disqualified from holding a public office for five years and had to pay the cost of a civil suit filed against him by a Canetto resident. In another blow to Canetto residents who'd placed great faith in Giuseppe's father, Antonino, Antonino Petzino was found guilty of collaborating with his son in the arson of a vehicle and for aggravated fraud to obtain public funds. He was sentenced to one and a half years behind bars. Both men will have to pay the expenses of the municipality of Coronia and another civil party that filed against them, and compensation for damages caused by their crimes. Every update on this court case I could find was Google translated from Italian and murky to wade through, but it sounded like they may have appealed these convictions. It looks like the men were only charged with the arsons that were caught on camera, therefore none of the fires prior to 2014 were included leaving massive speculation that there were other causes for the ones that took place a decade earlier. With no arrests made in those cases, and their cause never identified, they remain officially unexplained. As news of Giuseppe's arrest spread to the rest of the world, the journalists finally stopped traveling to Canetto, but that didn't stop the public speculation. The case is still discussed on internet forums and in videos like this one, with many people convinced the answers lie in the supernatural, extraterrestrial, or a government cover-up. It doesn't help that Sicily does have a long, contentious history with foreign militaries, and even their own. Canetto di Coronia locals still insist that nobody saw Giuseppe or Antonino enter any homes, and many of the fires seemingly occurred spontaneously, especially those earlier ones. Some of the investigators will even attest to that. And for those who believe the whole town may have been in on a scam to receive public funds, during the fires, many of the residents replaced or repaired damaged items, some multiple times, at their own expense. Many of their losses were irreplaceable family heirlooms. In a village where family is everything and the past is held very close to their hearts, 
I find it difficult to believe they'd sacrifice such priceless possessions for the possibility of upgrading their homes or vehicles. From what I've been able to see, there are definitely still some questions that haven't been answered, but as with so many of these freaky situations, I doubt the general public will ever get those answers. That's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this story and will come back for more. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, and bring your friends, family, COVID pod, cult members, invisible friends, or enemies. And if you have a theory on what the heck was actually going on in this town, leave it in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching.